Welcome to lesson number eight, Comfort My People. Once again, Brian is always with me on the program, bringing you the lesson. Brian, welcome. Thanks, Amir, and welcome to all the listeners and viewers. May the Lord bless you as we study this wonderful uh, Bible study today. Please just pray for us as we open God's word. Sure, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the comforting message that you have for us from the book of Isaiah. Especially as we study Isaiah 40, 41, we thank you, dear Jesus, that you are the servant that came to save us. You became a suffering servant that through your wonderful life that was sacrificed for our sins, we might have the comfort, the blessed assurance that we can be saved in eternity with thee. Bless each listener. Bless us as we study now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Isaiah 40 verse 9 is the theme text. <clears throat> Get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. So today we're going to learn more from the book of Isaiah. Mm. And especially some of the promises that God has given them, and that's really should have been comforting for them, that God's got a greater purpose, a greater plan after um, the kingdom of Babylon mm. for the Israelites. So we are going to start with Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2. We're going to read that together, Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So here God says, comfort my people. She has received double for what she has done. And obviously this refers to the fact that Assyria came and conquered them. And Babylon came and conquered them. And God said, now that the punishment is finished, comfort my people. Or it's a prophecy pointing to the future. Comfort my people. There is coming a time of peace and rejoicing. Now, Brian, could you give us a little bit more detail about this Assyrian punishment and this Babylonian punishment so we can understand what is God saying to us in these texts? So, Renier, this is, uh, you know, as we studied this uh, chapter and, yes, the, the, the next chapter, um, God shows that because he alone can declare the former things, that which is present and that which is future, he alone is God. Um, so, so Israel had gone into captivity, the northern tribes, the ten, because of their persistent rebellion and their idolatrous practices. So, so God had warned them through Moses long before they entered the children, uh, the children of Israel entered the promised land. Don't serve the idols of the other gods, mm -hmm. um, and that's exactly what they did. Um, and so they were punished. Judah too, as you mentioned, uh, forty-two cities were taken. Just Jerusalem alone. And had it not been for the mighty intervention of God's hand. When just one angel struck 185,000 Assyrian soldiers that had uh, surrounded the city of Jerusalem to take it by siege, the city would have fallen. So when we think about this year, uh, they paid a heavy price. King Ahaz fell into idolatry. And uh, we see time and time again, every time a king who did not follow the counsels of God, that did not obey the prophets and would not be obedient to God's will, we find the nation slipped into idolatry every time. So we have these highs and lows, highs and lows, and more lows and highs. So, so when we think about Babylon that hasn't yet come, I mean, Babylon at this point when Isaiah is prophesying is not a mighty nation to be reckoned with. And God is saying it will come. I mean, he's declaring hundreds of years, 150 years before Cyrus was born, names him, how the city would be conquered. And of course, at that time, the children of Judah would be in the city. So, so God says, let's see if your gods can state their case. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have idols. Some make them out of silver, some gold, some wood. Uh, state your case. Tell us whether things in the 
future what they will be so that we may know you, we may know you are gods so 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 obviously the answer is no uh, they were just worthless things made by men's hands the point is Renir, as we look at god's word god is telling the children of judah in advance listen you're going to be punished because of your rebellion because of your idolatry but i'm bringing you a message of comfort a message of hope you will be restored mm. there will be a remnant and as we've been studying this is the theme that's the motif to the book there's always a remnant there's a remnant there's a remnant and and god wants to save everyone but only those who will hear and you know, there's that song, trust and obey, for there is no other way. And, and that was a sad state of Judah. They did not trust the word of the Lord. They did not trust the prophets. They rather trusted in the works of men, men's hands. And these idols had failed to save the nation. So God is saying, listen, they fell. They fell, they fell, they fell. And if you go the same way, you will fall too. Isn't it that uh, in, in Babylon, Babylon will fall. Mm. Uh, not literal only, but also spiritual Babylon it will fall. It's fallen, it's fallen. So they receive double from the Lord. Thank you for that detailed answer, Brian. Uh, what I like about um, this part of the lesson is that they say that they refer you to the end of suffering when it comes especially to the practical part, that there mm. is an end of suffering coming, not just in a future life, but I believe we can experience it in some form or way, no. even in our present life. Before I explain that, I would just like to read Isaiah 14, 1 through 4 in the lesson as it is summed up. But the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will again choose Israel and will set them in their own land. When the Lord has given you rest from your pain and turmoil mm. and the hard service with which you have made to serve, you will, make, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. So God mm. promised it to Israel. And I believe when we study people in the Bible, we find the same thing. Think about yeah. Job. Terrible suffering that this man went through. Lost his children, lost his wealth, lost, his wife turned against him, and um, his friends turned against him. Terrible suffering. His health was affected. But at the end of the chapter, when God restores, when Job has learned the lesson that he needed to learn, and I, just, I don't believe it was just a lesson for Job, but it was a lesson for mm. everyone to live thereafter. Mm. Think, uh, it's also always fascinating for me that the oldest book in the Bible, first written by Moses, out of all the books, is the book about how the devil brings suffering to this world and what's God's role behind mm. the scenes, this great controversy when it comes to suffering. And the end of the book of Job says, Job had a prosperous life after that. It doesn't talk about, again, mm -hmm. losing all the children, losing his wealth. He didn't have to go through it again. So that's Job's story. Look at David's story. David had a pro prosper. He started off hard. Then it was a prosperous life. He made a mistake. He learned from his mistakes. Yes, he chilled, his children gave him grief, but still he had a more peaceful life as he went into his later years. If you think about Abraham, when Abraham learned his lessons through Egypt twice, mm. lying about his wife, etc., uh, when he learned his lessons, the Bible says he had a prosperous, peaceful life the rest of his life once he learned his lessons. The same with Jacob. And you can go through the men in the Bible. Once they've learned their lessons, there's no more need for it. Doesn't mean there's yeah. no suffering at all, like there's no hardship. You know, you still have to toil the the field, work hard in the field, you know, bring in the income, etc. But the Bible says there's an end of suffering, not just in this life, but the most important one is the life to come. No more suffering, mm. no more tears. This was a great comfort for the Israelites, but they had to believe the word of God. They had to believe mm -hmm. his prophets, as we said before, and then you will prosper, according to Second Chronicles 2020. Now, Monday's part is about presence, word, and road work. I'm going to read Isaiah 40, verse 3 and 8. These two texts really stood out to me. Isaiah 40, verse 3 and 8. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, Brian, as an evangelist, that verse just pops out, doesn't it? Yeah. That verse has got so much in it. And then verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now, what a powerful mm. thing for God to say through his prophet, after verse 1, when he said, comfort my people, comfort my people. And then he says, you know what? The grass withers, the flower fades, but my word 
stands forever, mm. meaning what I've said will happen. My word will not return unto me void. And that should be comfort when the God of the universe tells you that this suffering is going to come to an end and there is comfort coming. Now, how do they receive the comfort, Brian? How is God saying, you know, you need, we need to read verses 3 to 8 especially. What is this road work that is spoken about here in verse 3 mm. especially? So, so when you think about this, uh, Renir, as, as a person who has been to the Middle East, you know what the desert looks like. Uh, whether you're in Jordan, Egypt, or Israel, the desert is a harsh place. I mean, uh, it's tough to survive out there. Um, and, and here God says he's going to make a, a highway in the desert. Um, when you think of a highway in the desert, you say, wow, you know, it's so hot out there just to try and dig and make the, 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 the hills low. Uh, you think about um, like Mount Sinai, for example, it's just hill after hill and it's rocky hills and rocky hills. But God says, I'm going to make a highway. Uh, when they were in the desert, through the providence of God, he made a highway for them. Uh, their, their feet, their, their sandals never wore out. Uh, they had water to drink every day. You know, water in the desert is, is probably the most precious commodity. They had manna. Uh, they had a cloud uh, by day for shade and uh, a pillar of fire by night. Um, it's, it's incredible what God says. Every valley shall be made low. So when you think about when a king visited in, in, in the ancient days, they had to prepare the way. Now, you know, today kings fly in with jets. No problem. You know, you get there refreshed uh, in first class. You step off the plane as if, you know, you just left your house a few hours ago. Hmm. But those days, kings would have to go on horseback on a bumpy chariot. Uh, they had to make uh, the, 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 the places level. They had to remove the stones. Uh, God says, I'm going to take the rough places off. Um, and then he says, that the glory of the Lord may be revealed. Now, that's, that verse spoke to me. That the glory of the Lord may be revealed. Now, now Babylon was to be the glory of the nations. They claimed to be the most prosperous and most glorious kingdom. They had more gold than any other nation. Well, God said, listen, I am going to do that for you. Not with little gold, but with my glory, with my love, with my presence, with my protection. That's what God said. God would give them a high place in the world. What is that high place? Not that people would just look up to them. No, that people might see they are the children of the Lord, that they love people, that they care for the poor, that they even take in strangers into their home. You know, uh, when we get to um, Isaiah 58, that's just a, a wonderful chapter of how we ought to live the life of uh, that which Christ wants us to live, being kind to people who uh, are poor, being uh, willing to help people who are in need. You know, these are the attributes that God is saying. They would be a light unto the Gentiles. When you think about a dark place and you see a light, I mean, it's just so comforting. So, so this was the comforting thought that God would establish them, that God would provide for their every need and that he would lead them to be a highway too for other nations to understand who this God is, this loving God that, that dwells with his people. You know, the idols, what were they? They were aloof, couldn't talk, couldn't see, couldn't relate. But here's God saying, I dwell among my people. I, I will give them as a light for the Gentiles. And that's, that's the message for us today. So it's interesting that there's a physical preparation when it comes to the restoration of the temple, when it comes to the mm -hmm. restoration of the city once they leave Babylon. And that is to do the roadworks, to get everything ready, to prepare it so that God's dwelling place, the temple, can once again be where it needs to be. And as you have rightly said, as a witness to others, and so that others can find this highway to <clears throat> salvation and to God. The fascinating thing is now, if we jump to the New Testament, where Jesus refers mm -hmm. to John the Baptist as the one that preached this right. message to prepare the way of the Lord, that there is also oh, a amen. spiritual preparation that needed to take place. And that spiritual preparation right. is a 
a message that is based upon faith in the word of God. Because if you look at this text in Isaiah yeah. chapter 40, you have God speaking, comfort my people, comfort my people, prepare the way in the wilderness for the Lord. And then he says, talking about his word, the flower fades, the grass withers, but my word will stand forever. So this preparation has to do with the belief in the word of God. And this is what the Israelites missed when Jesus came. John the Baptist prepared the way. Right. He told them exactly what they needed to do to be prepared to receive the Messiah. I mean, John even pointed to Jesus as the Messiah. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They had all the preparation needed, and the Pharisees stood there. They listened, etc., but they couldn't accept the word of God. Their world, their ideas overrode the words of the Bible. I mean, how many times did Jesus tell them, what does it say in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. Didn't Isaiah wrote? Yeah. Etc. Yet they did not accept this. They did not accept the word of God. And God wants to prepare our hearts for the final message that goes to the world. Mm -hmm. And our hearts need to be prepared too. That road work needs to be done. And it's a faith in the word of God. Self needs to die. And we need to let the word of God reign. And on Tuesday's part, it talks about the birth of evangelism. And it once again goes into this story of what I believe John the Baptist can still be quite relevant in that message on Tuesday. So, Brian, what, how did you understand this part of the lesson? So when we look at Isaiah 40, the birth of evangelism, this is just absolutely really resonating with me because as I, as I, as I look at this, it says here, Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. And as evangelists, that's, that, that's, that's our message that we take to the people. Behold your God. Uh, the whole idea of going to talk and preach and teach is to lead people, as John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who mm. takes away the sin of the world. So when we think about the birth of Jesus, the angel said to the, the shepherds out in the field there, Behold, we bring good tidings of great joy. This day is born a Savior unto you in Bethlehem. I mean, Bethlehem, the house of bread. So, so that, that was like the best news. Of course, when John the Baptist, the herald of Jesus, the messenger that went before him, uh, pointed people to behold the Lamb, uh, that was the greatest revelation. Here is Jesus now. He's just been baptized and he's bringing this comfort. He says, I will feed the flock like a shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He said, I will gather the lambs in my arms. Uh, and he is the true lamb of God who comes to give the, the good news, the gospel, that, that unto you I will appear, not just through a prophet, but in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, the father comes and he says to gently lead you. So, so, so this is great news, Renier, when we think about it. Um, and and, and in, in, uh, in verse 40, it says, the grass will the flower face, but the word of God stands forever. So, so the kingdoms of Babylon with all their glory were like the grass that just withered. They're here today, they're gone tomorrow. Mm. But if we trust in the Lord, He's there for us every single day, every step of our life. No matter if we go into the valleys and we are discouraged, he's still there with us. He's the God of the valley and of the mountain. And he brings us through. Uh, so this, 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 this chapter really spoke to me because this, where, this is where it makes a difference for us as Christians. Do we have faith in God? Are we beholding the Lamb? Are we comforted by his presence or are we preoccupied? And that's the problem with the children of Israel. They were preoccupied with the material and transient things. And so that is still one of the devil's biggest tools. He wants to distract us from the word of the Lord. And as soon as we distract from the word of the Lord, of course, we'll end up in trouble. And we'll end up worshiping idols for sure. Maybe not idols of silver and gold or stone. But we will certainly worship idols because in us, there's always that idea, that desire to worship something. And if it's not God, it's going to be something. Exactly. And what I like about also Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 11 is where 
it points to the fact that you need to look at where God has led you. It says he will feed his flock like a shepherd. Mm. He would gather the lambs of his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. So God promises that what he would right. do. And the lesson asked the question, why is it good to recount in your mind the way the Lord has led you? Um, basically referring to God's providence, the way he works in your life. It is vitally important because the book Steps to Christ tells us that God speaks to us in four ways. There's a fifth one in Desire of Ages, or Patriarchs and Prophets, where it talks about God's judgment. But there are four ways God wants to speak to us. is through his spirit, through the word, through his providence, and through nature. So his providence actually helps us to understand the way he has led us to comfort us in our current circumstances that he'll also do it in the future. So it really empowers you to see what God has done. That's why I have, and I've done this so many times in my, my 14 years as a, as a Christian, I have this little book. And in this book, um, there are certain promises that God has given. And I write down every time the Lord says something aligned with that promise or comforts us or whatever needs to happen so that I can refer back to it and say, this is how God has led us. So when it comes, mm. when this promise comes, when, when we like, I can just imagine the Israelites when Artaxerxes said, you may go. Some of them probably thought, oh, we can actually go. I don't think if the, how's this going to work? How are we going to rebuild? Who's going to be our leader? Um, are we going to give everything up after 70 years? I mean, 70 years is a long time to stay in one place. And then for somebody to just tell you to, to go, you, you, you would almost doubt. I can even imagine the Israelites when they came out of Egypt and they actually said it many times. You know, we need to go back to Egypt. We had our food. Yes, we were slaves, mm -hmm. but we had food. We have shelter. We had all those things. Now we're in the wilderness and we're starving and we're hungry, etc. Now, the Red Sea experience for Israel was a perfect example of trusting in the Lord when you don't have food. And then he gave them manna, trusting in the Lord when he gave mm. you water out of the rock. All his providences was evidence that God is with them. And it should be the same for us. When God has promised something, you move forward as he directs, as he guides. And when it comes to pass, and it's difficult Look back at the way he has led. His providence speaks to our current circumstances. Now, Wednesday's mm -hmm. part is the merciful creator. We had to read Isaiah 40, 12 through 31. There's a couple of verses there that stand, stood out for me. Let's go. Verse 21 stood out. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Asking questions just like God did to Job. Then in verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the God, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. I mean, that should have been much comfort for Israel in their circumstances. And then in verse 29, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. And then verse 31, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Popular verse. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So God is, God is basically proclaiming who he is. And through the proclamation of who he, he is himself, and that he's the creator, he then imparts comfort and strength to the weak. How powerful is that? God is an amazing God. Your strength is dependent upon the creator and not yourself. Now, Brian, before I start preaching about this, because I get excited about these scriptures, what, what are your thoughts in regards to the merciful creator and why God is asking these type of questions to actually confirm the comfort he's giving in verses one through three? So we see here, Rainier, as, as God gives these wonderful verses of comfort, uh, they, they're coming with the same uh, message from Isaiah that there will be judgment. The nation will go into captivity. And uh, only God can predict that whilst they go through this experience, uh, as you said, the providences of God, um, this experience would make them depend and look to God as their only source of strength, as their creator, 
And so the contrast in the, in the chapter between the creator and the created, between the idolaters that, that created their own God and the true God who is their creator, uh, shows that God is comparable, incomparable rather, mm. beyond measure. So, so, so they try to compare God. And it's interesting as you look at some of the forms of idolatry that Judah went into, they would worship an idol and actually declare that idol to be the Jeho Jehovah God. Um, where some of them, that people like Manasseh, people like Ahaz, I mean, that passed their children to the fire, which was sacrificed them. I mean, they were like into steep occultic practices. But there were those who were like the in-between, you know, it's okay to have this um, representation. Some people will say, and I've heard this before, well, you know, I'm not worshipping the idol, you know, it's, it's just there to remind me. Well, God says, no, don't liken me to that. Don't use that to remind me, to remind you of me. You know, the, the only reminder God has given us is the Sabbath. Mm. That reminds us of who he is because he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So, so if, if God's children had kept the Sabbath in its true original design, there would not be an idolater. Because every time you come to Sabbath, you remember, wow, I'm created by God and I'm created in his image. So who am I to make an image of God and then say, okay, this is your God. And, and so the, the, the comfort was the creator God. I mean, uh, have you not heard? Ha has not anyone told you that the Lord, the creator, uh, he is the true God. There is no other God besides. So, so the promises came one after the other. And I'm sure many of us, um, I've claimed those promises that he will give, you know, strength to those who are weak, that he'll cause you to ride upon, you know, the wings of an eagle. Um, the young men shall utterly fail, uh, but God gives strength. So, so as you look at God's desire for the children of Judah, yes, you're going to go into captivity, but I will be with you there. And those who obeyed God whilst they were in captivity, they were able to see the bigger picture. Those who took the eyes of God, we read the account there in Nehemiah, we read the account in Ezra, they were comfortable in Babylon now. They didn't want to go back after the king had given the decree. It's time for you to go back to your home. No. So the king had to now, you know, kind of like give them some encouragement to go. But, but that's true to life, isn't it, Renil? Mm -hmm. So often we become comfortable in this world that the things of heaven now don't seem to matter anymore. But as soon as those things are removed, mm. oh, then we crying the Lord, Lord, please help me. You know, we need uh, food on our table. Lord, please help us. You know, um, we, we've got financial difficulties. Lord, please help us. You know, we, our health is challenged. But um, God is so gracious. In spite of all that, he loves us and he always brings a message of hope, even when we are in rebellion, as the case was with Judah. It's very important to keep that connection with God when you're prospering, when things are going well. Because he's, 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 not a, mm. he's not someone that just you just approach because you're going through a bad time. He needs to be your friend. Right. And your friend is not just there mm. because you're going through a bad time. It's also there when you go through your good times. So we need to stay that connected and make sure that we don't make those idols, as you uh, rightly pointed out to. And that is Thursday's part of the lesson, um, which is a big problem with idolatry, is that in the end of the day, um, we can easily commit spiritual adultery by having an idol. Mm. I mean, you said earlier, you know, I have this idol to remind me of the creator because I can't see him. And like Israel did when they made the golden calf, they said, Moses is in the mountain. We can't see our leader. We can't see our God. Yeah. So make us a God that will take us back to Egypt. You know, one that we can see, mm. one that we can touch. And what we need to understand is, None of us who are married will say to our wives, you know what? I keep on looking at that other woman because it reminds me of you. <laughs> I mean, no wife would be happy if you say something like that. They would say, are, are you serious? Just be with no. me and I will remind you of me. 
So I just need to connect with God and he would remind me that he is the creator, that he's the one that's in charge of my life, that he is the one that works through me. And this is just jumping back to Wednesday's part is that the fact that he is the creator and say, because of my creatorship, I will strengthen you in your weakness. It actually gives me courage mm. and, and, and faith to live this Christian life, even with more boldness in Christ, humility and boldness, because I know that my creator will finish the work in me. My creator, if I submit mm. to him, will give me strength when I'm weak. My creator is the one that is in charge. And the Sabbath, as you rightly said, is that reminder that he would sanctify us and do that work in us that he has said. Now, Brian, before we end off, what are, you, what are your thoughts? In, in uh, You've mentioned already a lot about adult, uh, idolatry. Uh, what else would you like to add on Thursday's part of the lesson? So, so when we look at the problem of idolatry, Renier, um, so often... <clears throat> The, the worshippers of idols always want to bring in God, whom they believe is the true God, to be represented by that. So you just mentioned the, 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 the incident between the golden calf. And, and, and when Aaron had fashioned it, the people said, this is the, the God that brought us out of Egypt. Now, that golden calf could do absolutely nothing when they faced Pharaoh's army. Uh, but what did God do? He brought a cloud between them and then blows a strong wind to clear a path in the sea. They cross on dry land. On the other side, when they're there, Pharaoh tries to come through. God stops the wind. I mean, the calf could do none of that. Hmm. When they cried for water and they needed food, where was the golden calf? Um, it's only when they couldn't see Moses. And that's the problem with human beings. We, we like to have something that we can touch, something that's tangible. And yet the Bible says, you know, it's through faith that we are saved. I mean, Ephesians 2 verse 8, by grace you are saved through faith um, and not of works. But here they are. They want to fashion something with their hands, works. And then they want to say that's a representation of God. Mm. And, and, and that's the problem with human beings. So easily we want to diminish who God is. And yet he says, I am the Holy One who inhabits the circle of the earth. Um, the Holy Shekinah in the sanctuary, that was a representation of God. And, and when he came down, they were fearful. Mm. They, they couldn't look. When Moses came down and said, no, you know, please don't, don't let God speak to us. You speak to us. But when Moses was gone for 40 days, you know, we don't know what's happened to Moses. You know, we don't know what's become of him. Let's make a God. So that's the problem with human beings. We want to always see things with our eyes. We want to touch with our hands. We want to experience. And many times God is saying, trust me, my word is dependable. My promises are true. And uh, Renier, I, I know you've had those experiences. I've had those experiences. When I trust in the word of God and I take his promise and, and I believe in it and he comes through for me, that is something far more wonderful for me than anything else that I can touch or handle or taste or smell. Uh, ultimately, God says to us, I'm your creator. And when you think about creation, it says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Mm -hmm. And what did God do? He comes to dwell with, them, with his people. Of course, sin shed that experience. And that's what Jesus comes to bring back. And that's the comforting message because Emmanuel, God with us, has come. And he's representing us at the throne now. We have an advocate of the Father, Christ the righteous. And so we have this real experience, but it is by faith. Amen. And so my last words, Renier, you know, this is one of my, one of my wonderful texts I like to, uh, to, to claim almost every day. Uh, and it's well known to most of us. Philippians 1 verse 6. Mm. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, is faithful to complete it. So God is still fashioning my character. Mm. God's still working on you. He's, he's polishing me and he's, he's chiseling sometimes the rough edges. It's, is it painful? Yes, ouch, it's so. Um, we don't like discipline. We don't like to go through the hard places, but sometimes God has al allows us to go that way so that we can look up. Sometimes that's the only way we will look up, unfortunately. Uh, that's the human experience. But, but God says, listen, if you'll allow me, Brian, 
Uh, if you will let me be the potter and you become the clay in my hands, I will fashion you, I will mold you, I'll make you into a vessel. And I, as the potter, I will make it perfect. Uh, I will recreate my image in you so that you don't have to run after the images of this world. You don't have to run after the riches. You don't have to run after the fame. You don't have to run about your, your business, your career. You know, we, we, we make idols of so many things when God is saying, take time to know me. I'm your God. I love you. If you will take time in your relationship with God, the life will be sweet. Uh, the way of the transgressor is hard. But those who come to the Lord, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We praise God for that. Amen. On that note, I want to ask the viewers that you subscribe if you have not subscribed yet. Click on the bell and on all. Make sure you are informed when we upload new videos. And may God bless you. Until we study again next week, we are already coming to the end of the book of Isaiah. Only a couple of more weeks mm. left, or maybe three or four weeks. Mm. Um, but it still feels like, you know, we hardly started. And, and here right. we are at the end almost. So may God bless you, Brian. Thank you again for joining. Let's just end off in prayer. Father mm -hmm. in heaven, thank you for this lesson. Thank you that we can learn that you are the creator. You are in charge. And if we believe your word, you've mm -hmm. got amazing things in store for us. Father, mm -hmm. I pray that you will prepare our hearts, that we will be ready for the ultimate end of suffering when Jesus returns. Bless each mm -hmm. viewer. Keep us safe until next time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.